Hello, welcome to this Toxic Googe of Google virtual event. I'm Megan Green Rogers. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, David Stork. David is widely considered a founding pioneer in the application of rigorous computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence applied to problems in the history and interpretation of fine art. He published several of the first scholarly works in the field, offered its first courses, co-founded its first conference, and published the first textbook pertaining to the field, Pixels and Paintings. David is an adjunct professor at Stanford University, holds 64 issued patents, and has published over 220 scholarly works, including nine books. Today, we will discuss his research article entitled, When Computers Look at Art. David, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you everyone for listening in. Computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence have revolutionized every discipline that deals with images, from remote sensing and medical image analysis and autonomous driving and on and on and on. Every field except one, art history. And that's sort of surprising because the images we find in our art museums are some of the most subtle, interesting, deep, and meaningful images ever created. Um, and they've posed problems to scholars for decades, indeed centuries. Well, a small number of us worldwide are indeed using computer vision and AI to address problems in the history of art. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. This is um, a summary from my article in last month's CA cover article in CACM and my um, new book that just came out, Pixels and Paintings, foundations of uh, computer-assisted connoisseurship. Now, normally I give lots of talks at museums explaining to art scholars how computing can help them. So for instance, just yesterday I was lecturing at the um, uh, Legion of Honor in San Francisco. Next week I, I lecture at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. The week following that I lecture at the Royal Academy of Art in, in London and on and on and on. But I think for Google, I will assume that you're not real art experts or professional art scholars, but you are interested in the technology. And the, my main point here is that I think you should be interested in art because art poses new questions to AI and machine learning and so forth that are not adequately addressed by mainstream AI. And they fall into a number of categories. The first is style whereas most traditional AI works with uh, photographs and videos and so forth, style is an incredibly important part of um, art. And recognizing style, si quantifying style, how it changes, then doing image processing and image analysis in styled works, segmentation, object recognition, and so forth. We deal with small data sets. As you may know, as you certainly know, the most successful AI systems are deep networks trained with millions, indeed billions of photographs and videos and so forth. Whereas in art, we don't have that luxury of that many artworks. An artist such as Vermeer will leave us just 34 artworks. And how do we deal, how do we learn from such a small data set? Likewise, we deal with non-realistic objects. Um, soft watches and, and so forth that do not appear in normal image uh, training sets and so forth. So how do you deal with things that uh, really don't come from a, a physical basis? Art is also multimodal. By that I mean we have, um, it's made up of layers. There'll be, x-rays will reveal the earliest so-called pentimenti, the drawings beforehand and how an artwork changes over time. And that often tells us a great deal about the artist's intent and helps us um, detect fakes and so forth. That's not really addressed by mainstream AI. Then there are a lot of unphysical conventions. Most traditional AI deals with photographs that are taken from the real world where physics holds and so forth. Not so, artworks are often generally made from the artist's imagination where babies can fly, they have wings and so forth. How do we uh, tr get a training set and how do we deal with those kinds of problems? Abstraction is an, a major problem. Uh, recognizing artists um, 
by their abstract works, um, understanding simple meanings and so forth, tracking changes in abstract art and so forth. Um, a in very interesting problem I'm working on now is art recovery. Some of the most important artworks ever created are lost, have been lost to fire, flood, war, and so forth. But can we take surviving sketches and the um, surviving works by the particular artist and textual description of a lost artwork, put those together with deep networks in order to get an approximation of what a lost artwork might have looked like. I think this will help revolutionize the study of art to include works that were important but now don't uh, survive. And I think the biggest and most interesting problem posed by art involves meaning and semantics. In traditional AI, you have semantic image analysis where you'll have a photograph and the AI system will say, oh, there's a man on a bicycle and there's a tree in the background and they're eating sushi and so forth. Well, art is very different. Art goes beyond the surface description of what is on <laughs> in the image to the artist's intent, the artist's meaning and so forth. And this is really not addressed by mainstream AI and should be and is posed by art. Let me now show you some of the techniques, some of the tools that we're providing to art scholars. And I'll start with one from one of my students here at Stanford, uh, analyzing pose in portraits. Of course, the pose of a sitter is very important for the reading of the work and the meaning and so forth. And traditionally, art scholars do it by eye and say, oh, this is a portrait view or three quarters view and so forth. Well, they also will deal with, I don't know, five or six or seven artworks at a time because that's how long it takes. But we want to do it using computers so that we can deal with very large corpora of, of portraits. So we represent the location angles of the um, sitter's head by roll, yaw, and pitch. If you are a pilot like me, you know these uh, rotation angles. And we have the sort of image model as projection of key points, the corners of the eye, the tip of the nose, corners of the mouth, and so forth, onto the picture plane. Um, and not that it, it was done literally using any sort of optics or geometry or so forth, but this is just sort of the artist's forward model. And based on the locations of these key points, we can infer the rotation angles. We use, we've tried two deep neural networks to do this. I won't go through the the technical details, but it means that we can now deal with, so here are some um, uh, sample results of the yaw rotation angle for three paintings. It works even for paintings like uh, Modigliani here at the right, not particularly realistic. And now we can uh, apply this to 11,000 paintings uh, in a database um, in, you know, five minutes on a, on a laptop. And I won't go through all the, the data here. These are different art movements from the early Renaissance, the high Renaissance, Rococo, neoclassicism, and so forth. These are um, box whisker diagrams, basically histograms of the, ro the uh, roll angle in different art movements. And let's just focus on two of them, ukiyo-e, the Japanese woodblock prints, um, and so-called naive art or primitivism. You'll notice that in ukiyo-e um, prints, the average rotation roll angle is very large and the distribution, the incredible range is very, very large. Whereas for naive art, it's very small and the average rotation angle is very, very small. And so here's how you can visualize it, the ukiyo-e on the left here. These are often, um, so-called mie poses in kabuki dances where the actors, the male actors, will strike a pose and tip their head for dramatic effect. And that's why we see all these rotation angles very, very large. Whereas in primitive art on the right, uh, these are generally untrained artists or even um, um, superb artists like Matisse at the lower left, um, deliberately trying to be so-called childlike and so forth. And so we can now look at trends. We're now generalizing this to look at the difference in poses for men and women over large corpora, much, much larger uh, data sets than we ever could have uh, doing it merely by eye. We didn't plan on this, but it turns out our system can detect whether a self-portraitist is right-handed 
or left-handed because they tip different ways. Um, even amidst a, a search over 20,212 portraits, we can tell who is right-handed and left-handed. Can't do this by traditional methods, by eye. Now I want to turn to another technique uh, we're using in art analysis, lighting analysis. This is Johannes Vermeer's very famous girl with a pearl earring in the Maritzhaus Museum in The Hague. And if we, and Vermeer is widely recognized as a master in rendering the effects of light. But if we ask the simplest technical question about the illumination in this painting, it would be what's the direction of illumination? And if two art scholars disagreed, how would we adjudicate? Turns out humans are actually are not very good at detecting uh, direction of illumination, but these computer methods are absolutely superb, as I'll show you. The six methods we used fall into two general categories. Model independent methods are those in which we don't need to know or make any assumptions about the three-dimensional form of her face. So we'll look at a cast shadow and we'll use the so-called occluding contour algorithm. And then there are model dependent methods where we do need to make some assumptions or use knowledge about the three-dimensional form um, uh, in the tableau. We'll make a computer graphics model of the pearl, of her eye, of the face, and a full 3D computer graphics model. So the simplest method is cast shadow analysis. You take a point on an occluder, like the tip of her nose, its corresponding cast shadow point, and uh, the angle is 150 degrees plus or minus two, where throughout I'm going to measure angles with respect to the horizontal, like that. The occluding contour algorithm is based on a branch of computer vision called shape from shading. Uh, the brightness in an image, like a photograph, will depend upon the direction of illumination and the um, normal, the perpendicular line at a given surface. And if we had a model, if a 3D model of her face, we would know these normals, but we don't, or we assume for now we don't. Um, well, the uh, brightness will depend upon the overall reflectivity of the um, or albedo of the face, is it white or black or gray or other color, and the dot product, the angle between the direction of the illumination and um, the normal to the face, and there might be some overall ambient term, overall ambient light. And the problem is we don't know the normal vector, NX, the components NX, NY, and NZ. But two computer vision experts, Nelius and Eklund, came up with a very clever solution to this. They said, all right, we don't know what the normal is throughout a face or any object, but along the outer boundary or occluding contour, we do. The normal must be perpendicular to the contour and in the plane of the painting. It's not tipping towards us or away. It's like a flagpole on the horizon. And that means the Z component of the normal vector is zero. It's not pointing towards us or away. And we can actually measure or determine the normal vector at each point along the occluding contour. And I won't go through all the mathematics, but if we measure the lightness along the outer boundary, we can then infer what direction of illumination best explains the pattern of lightness along the outer boundary. Here are the equations, I won't go through them. Or here's another way to look at it. We have a 3D object, and if I just measured the lightness at one point, it's determined by three things, and I have one equation and three unknowns, and I can't solve it. But if I measure the lightness along the entire contour, then I can. Look at the middle bar, it's bright. It's probably perpendicular to the light source. The other ones are further away. And the math I just went through finds the best direction uh, consistent with all that. And when I published the first paper on this, I, like a good scholar, I tried to find out if anybody else had done this. Turns out Leonardo da Vinci did. Um, in one of his notebooks, he studied how bright should he paint the outer, the occluding contour, he didn't use that term, but the outer contour, depending upon where the light is. When the light strikes perpendicularly, it should be bright. When it's at, uh, further away and the light is glancing, it should be darker. So we do the inverse and measure that brightness and then infer the direction to the illumination. This was developed actually for, for forensic photography. Here's a photo of Brad and Angelina that was tampered, cut from one, uh, two different images and photoshopped together into a single image. 
And Hani Farid and his colleagues um, uh, used the occluding contour alg algorithm on Brad and, and Angelina and found that the directions were different. This was Photoshopped, tampered as we say. But we were the first to ever apply these techniques to paintings. And here it is on the girl with the pearl earring. Um, and the angle turns out to be 149 plus or minus uh, four degrees. Now for the model dependent methods. I took a high resolution photograph of the pearl in that painting and um, I hence could get the mathematical form of the outer boundary, the occluding contour. And we confidently assume that the pearl is cylindrically symmetric and we can make a computer graphics model of it. You have to do texture mapping, add the white to it. And because a, uh, such a surface has specular or mirror-like and then diffuse reflections, you have to adjust that by eye. And here's the model. And then in the computer graphics model, we can place the illuminant wherever we want until the rendered pearl matches that in the painting as closely as possible. And that gives us an estimate to the direction of the illumination. And it turns out to be 155 plus or minus four degrees. What about the highlights on the eyes? Well, if the eyeball is the red sphere and the eye E is the artist's eye and the unknown source is at some position, the light rays uh, lie in a plane and obey the law of reflection, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And hence to infer the direction to the illumination you take a, in the painting, you put a dot in the middle of the eye, draw a straight line, green arrow through the center of mass of the highlight, and that tells us the direction to the illumination. Turns out to be 150 plus or minus two degrees. The most sophisticated technique uh, we used was again based on shape from shading. If you had a model of her face, if you could use the uh, shape from shading algorithms to infer what direction of illumination on that model best explains the pattern of lightness you find in the painting. But we didn't have a model of her face, so we did the next best thing. We used a computer graphics model, it's actually of a man's face. We adjusted its pose to match the girl as closely as possible. And we temporarily assumed that was her face and then used shape from shading to find an estimate to the direction of illumination. Of course, that's not gonna be right because this is not her accurate face. But we then temporarily fixed the estimate of the direction of illumination, said, all right, that's the, the direction of illumination. And the computer algorithm fixed her face, changed the brightness of the nose and so forth all the way throughout to better match the pattern of lightness that we find in the painting. Now we have a better model of her face. And then we can go back and re-estimate the direction to the illumination. Now we have a better and go back and forth and back and forth until it settles down. Then we get a better model of her face and the um, uh, better model of the direction to the illumination. Anyone who's studied pattern classification or mach machine learning will recognize this as the EM or expectation maximization algorithm. And the direction turns out to be 160 plus or minus five degrees. Then we built a full 3D computer graphics model of the face and we have to make some assumptions about the 3D form, but um, uh, once we have it, we can then uh, direct the light, uh, font, place the light a little bit too high, a little bit too low and so forth until it actually matches the painting as closely as possible. And that gives us an estimate to the direction of illumination. It turns out to be 160 plus or minus five degrees. So here are our results, and the answer turns out to be 155 degrees, which is not very interesting. But what is interesting is the very small standard deviation, the incredible agreement among these um, different estimation methods. So the red line goes off into that 155 degrees, and the yellow line is called a cardioid. It tells us the relative probability of finding the light in different directions. The fact that it's long and drawn out shows how well these these all agree. And that's a testament to how good, um, how careful Vermeer was in rendering the effects of light. But art historians are interested in this because this is not a portrait. We don't know who this girl is. It's a so-called trony or character study. And scholars debated whether there was actually a girl present when he painted. Maybe he did it from his imagination. The fact that these all agree so well certainly proves that there was indeed a, a girl present.
And these techniques can also be used in analyzing multi-figure portraits where if the light is consistent on, let's say, three of the figures, but not for the fourth, it would suggest that one of those figures was painted later under different studio conditions, maybe by a different artist. So it's all information for that. Now I want to use, uh, show how we've used some of these methods for answering a debate in the history of art. When you stand back and look at the grand sweep of the development of Western painting, you find something very interesting happened around 1430. Look at this Giotto fresco portrait. It's rather awkward and schematic. And likewise, this Austrian portrait of a king and this lovely Mazzolino, almost porcelain doll-like portrait. But after that time, we get paintings like this, Robert Campin's A Man of 1430. It looks so realistic, almost photographic. This portrait has a personality, an individuality, a psychological depth lacking in those earlier works. This guy looks like us. What happened? Well, in the year 2000, a uh, very famous painter, David Hockney, came up with a bold and very controversial theory that some of these early artists use optics during the execution of their works. He put this forth in his book, Secret Knowledge. Here's one of his paintings at the upper right. And partly he was influenced by the fact that he himself uses photographs as reference uh, when he makes uh, many of his paintings. Well, Here's how he demonstrates how he thinks artists like um, Jan van Eyck and others worked. There's the sitter is outside, there's a window and the artist is inside. Uh, and the key element at the right is the concave mirror, like a shaving or makeup mirror that projects an image onto the wall that the artist um, Hockney believes would trace and then uh, bring it down, fill in details and paint. And one of the paintings he adduces as evidence is Georges de la Tour's Christ in the Carpenter's Studio in the Louvre. He, he claims the source of light seems to be outside the picture, as it must be if you use optics. Joseph and the girl, it's not a girl, it's Christ, were probably painted separately, each lit by a shielded light source in place of the other figure. So in his book, Secret Knowledge, he shows two, I'll call them half paintings, he says, when Christ was painted, the light source was in place of St. Joseph. And when St. Joseph was painted, the light source was in place of Christ. So you have to look at this and say, where is the light source? And you're not very good. I'm not very good. No one's very good. Hockney's turns out, is not very good at estimating where the light source is. But the computer methods are extremely good. We take a cast shadow, the, cast, the shadow cast by the left thumb of St. Uh, Joseph and draw a straight line, it goes right to the candle, not outside the frame of the picture. And if you take a set of such can of cast shadows, you get this data. And I hope you can see the gray contours. Those are contours of equal a posteriori probability. It says it's most likely the light is at the candle, less likely further out, less likely further out, less likely further out, like a high weather, a high pressure region on a weather map. And I won't go through all the mathematics, but it's straight out of uh, maximum likelihood estimation, where you're putting together estimates from different uh, sources of information. Well, also, what about the light information or along those outer boundaries or including contours, like the knee? Well, we tried using the occluding contour on other paintings by um, artists of the time, Mannerist artists of the time, like Caravaggio and others, Georges de la Tour in, the, in LACMA in Los Angeles. And here it is applied to um, Christ in the Carpenter's studio. And so we researchers mark, the con mark which contours we're interested in, and the computer computes those red arrows and look how well they meet at the candle. Really uh, quite surprising. Even on the, the contour on Christ's shin, the computer looks at it and says, ah, the light is in this direction. Uh, really quite amazing. And you can use the same maximum likelihood estimation method to say, ah, given all this evidence, it's most likely the light is in the middle, further out, further out, further out. Hockney is just simply wrong. Um, one of the benefits of using a probabilistic approach is that we can integrate estimates by, in this case, cast shadows, because where you have a probability, 
and the occluding contours, and you put them together just by multiplying them. And bingo, it, the light is right at the candle, not in place of the other figures, not outside the frame. But there's other lighting information that we have not yet used, the pattern of light over, over the floor. Look, it's bright in the middle and it's dark off to the side. So if there's a light source, where would it be? I won't go through all the physics, the so-called forward model. We have the one over R squared brightness dependency, the so-called Lambert's cosine law and, and so forth. There's a lot of math, but it's just all to find the position of a light source that best explains the pattern of lightness over the floor. And this turns out to be the location. It's not exactly at the um, lamp, but it's certainly not, quote, outside the frame of the painting as Hockney uh, claims. Uh, I won't go through all of these, um, but there's still more lighting information that we have not exploited. Just as we did with the girl with the pearl earring, we make a computer graphics model. This is so-called wireframe. And we're going to put the light source in place of St. Joseph at the left and in place of the candle and illuminate Christ and see which one leads to an image that best matches the actual painting. Problem is we don't know the depth into the painting, into the tableau. So we tried 19 positions with the light source in place of St. Joseph and 19 in place of um, the candle, chose the best from each and then compared them. But here first is the computer graphics model of the um, uh, tableau. If you study art history, you learn that, you know, St. Joseph is a carpenter, so he has the tools. Christ is the light of the world. He has a candle. I hope you can see that the cast shadow is moving here as we adjust the position of the illuminant uh, throughout the tableau. And now we're going to rotate around and look at the whole tableau from the back and stop in the configuration that matches the painting as closely as possible. And uh, now we can look at the best image with the light source in place of St. Joseph at the left, and the best with the light source in place of the candle at the right, and see which one matches the painting best. And there's no question, not the slightest, that the light source in place of the candle best matches the actual painting. Look at the pattern of light over Christ's chest or the cast shadow by his leg and so forth. Uh, no question, um, Hockney is wrong. Another painting Hockney adduces as evidence is this incredibly important painting in the National Gallery in London, portrait of Arnolfini and his wife. Um, Hockney and his scientist uh, colleague, Charles Falco, suggest that the depicted mirror at the back was used as a projection mirror. They wrote, Van Eyck placed a convex mirror at the very center of this Arnolfini masterpiece. The very mirror, the very mirror which turned around he may well have used to construct the image. So here is a detail, of just a small part of that painting showing that convex mirror. You've certainly seen these in convenience stores to give a wide angle view. We see the back of Mr. Arnolfini. We see the back of his wife. We see the two witnesses to the wedding, but clearly it's a convex mirror because we can see that it's distorted the image. And um, we contest whether that was used by looking at its focal length. Given an image in, under a projection, like a photograph, we can infer its so-called focal length. Here's a picture of me as a beginning assistant professor many years ago at Swarthmore College, taken with a short focal length or 24 millimeter lens. And look at the size of me and the size of the pillars on Parish Hall back there. Then the photographer moved back and used a longer focal length lens, expands everything by, 20, uh, by a factor of two. Uh, but I'm the same size in all of these photographs, but the size of the pillars differ. Well, if we know the sizes of the objects in the, the tableau and we have a projected image, we can infer what focal length was used. I teach my undergraduate art, art history majors how to do this. Everybody can do it. Uh, here it is for Vermeer, that depending upon where the center of projection is, as we see in the left panels, um, it will lead to different perspectives. They're all in perfect perspective, but it's just where the vanishing points is and horizon lines and convergence lines and so forth. So for the Arnolfini portrait, we made a 3D computer graphics model. This is the mathematics. And here's a view 
of the side of the uh, from the side of the tableau and the painting to the uh, shown at the left, the image would be upside down. And I'm going to show it with a lens just because it's easier to see, but it's the same as with a concave mirror that uh, we find where we would place the film, the screen, the painting, and the um, projection optics such that the size of the image of the chandelier corresponds to that of the real chandelier. Of course, it's not real, it's computer graphics. Size of Arnolfini and Arnolfini and so forth for all those objects uh, within the tableau. And when you do that, you find that the uh, focal length turns out to be 61 plus, uh, plus or minus 8 centimeters. Well, we need to find the focal length of that convex mirror. Well, it's basic optics of law of reflection off of a sphere that leads to distortion of the image. And this is the mathematics at the top and the distorted grid um, uh, shown in the middle. And now we can use those formulas and adjust the radius of curvature, the bulginess, to de-warp the image by different amounts and search for a radius of curvature and hence focal length that um, uh, fits uh, the image that we find in the painting. And here is the best image we could get. Uh, notice the window is perfectly uh, rectilinear. The convergence lines are all lined up and so forth. And uh, now we have the radius of curvature and that then tells us the focal length. And if Hockney and Falco right, are right, these should be almost the same. But when you go through it, nope, 18 centimeters, much, much, much too short. They are simply wrong. Here from my Scientific American article is a way to visualize the difference in the radius of curvature and hence the focal lengths of the, the pr purported projection mirror at the back and what would be consistent with the actual image and so forth. Uh, might another mirror have been used? Actually, no, because the perspective is very um, inconsistent. Perspective lines don't all meet at a vanishing point, but we have straight lines, so it can't be explained by lots of refocusings and so forth. But then David Hockney got on CBS 60 Minutes and told 8 million people, quote, that chandelier is in perfect perspective. I thought I'd check. Here's an overhead view Oh, oh, and then he believes it was done using optics, which would give it in perfect perspective. Here's the overhead view or plan of the chandelier. Here are two corresponding points on the arms, like those decorative crockets that hang down. Those define a line in Arnolfini's room. That line is parallel to the floor. Um, likewise, these are parallel. All of these lines are perfectly parallel in the room. And so here, are what I just showed you. Now I'm showing it in green. If you think about symmetry, it's the same with the lines on the uh, other arms. And if you really think about it, um, lines defined by corresponding points on these two arms in the chandelier are all parallel. And so here's a computer graphics model of the chandelier. And if it's in perfect perspective, of course it is, it's computer graphics, then the projections of those lines should meet at a vanishing point. And when you do that, yep, they do, of course. There's the vanishing point. Here's the Arnolfini chandelier. If Hockney is right, then those same sorts of lines should meet at a vanishing point. But when you actually construct them, that's what you get. Absolutely, positively not. Not close to being in proper perspective. Not close. We are not very good, and Hockney is not very good at telling whether something is, quote, in perfect perspective. perspective. Absolutely, positively not. Not even close. Here's another way of looking at it here, lines drawn like this, lines drawn like this, and here 15 lines, no hint of a vanishing point beneath. And you can show that they're as much as 10 centimeters off, much too large. I won't go through the mathematics of um, homographies, but you can optimally warp one of those arms onto the other so as to compare their inherent shapes, and they turn out to be minus uh, 10 centimeters off, much, much too large to be consistent with Hockney's theory. He's simply wrong. And as part of my research, I asked, how well can an artist um, paint in perfect perspective uh, without any optical tools? And so there's Van Eyck at the left and 
uh, Nicholas Williams in England who painted uh, two chandeliers entirely by eye, and they are in extremely good perspective, much, much better than um, Van Eyck. He shows that, so here's one of his arms at the left, here's another one of the arms in, that he painted entirely by eye. You do the mathematics of homographies, you warp arm one to be as similar to art, arm two, overlap them, they overlap superbly. So Hockney is simply wrong. Just for the uh, record, here are the uh, dozens of scholars who have rebutted Hockney's um, uh, theory in peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and so forth. Now to some other techniques we're using unrelated to the Hockney debate. Um, segmentation of art images is very difficult. We've SegNet and other deep neural networks can segment photographs well, but they don't work that well on paintings. So here are five uh, original paintings and the segmentation done by deep neural networks, not particularly good, but we needed training data from, of artworks and there just aren't enough artworks in different styles. So we use deep neural net style transfer. Here's I am and a Cezanne painting to make a surrogate painting. This is what <laughs> I might've looked like in a portrait by Cezanne. And we could make literally millions of um, such images and use those to train a segmentation network. And our results then using that train network are much, much better. So this is how we get over the problem of um, small data sets, for, at least for the problem of um, segmentation. Now let me turn to a really hard problem <laughs> in art analysis, which is inferring the meaning within the deeper artist's meaning or intent in artworks. And let's just take for a moment religious art where we need to know the stories. Who are the actors in the, in the artworks? And in religious art, we have something called an attribute, that this is an object in Christian art. We have objects that are related to the identities of um, figures. So for instance, St. Peter has the keys to heaven. So he's often depicted, almost, I think almost always depicted holding keys. Well, we can use a deep neural network to recognize these different attributes. Uh, and we here we have a database of different attributes for different uh, figures. And we get a training set of large number of paintings having these attributes. And we can indeed recognize, oh, uh, a dove or the lion or the cross and so forth. So we can recognize those in paintings. And we use a deep neural network for segmenting the people. And then we'll take a painting like Verrocchio's Baptism of Christ and we can do the segmentation to find where the figures are. And then we also find where those attributes are. And using that database, we can go back and say, ah, the dove, this figure is probably Christ. Now, this is very simple. Every art scholar and most people can recognize who these actors are, but these are first steps for getting a computer to recognize these. So it, it can recognize this is Christ and this is St. John the Baptist and so forth. Uh, we can use different colors. Um, uh, Correggio's uh, painting yellow was a, um, the color associated with prostitutes, so it, we can recognize uh, Mary Magdalene by color and so forth. And I think the last painting I have time to talk about is um, uh, so-called Vanitas paintings um, here in the National Gallery in London. Um, Traditional AI will recognize, oh, that's a skull, that's a book and so forth, but it won't understand the deeper meaning, which in this case is the Vanitas meaning uh, message saying, Live, leave, lead a humble, sober life in this world so as to be prepared for the eternal world to come. And so the skull means mortality. The, the watch means time is ticking, your life is going away. The flame out on the oil lamp means that uh, life can be snuffed out and it, at any moment and so forth. This is incredibly rich with meaning. Can we get a computer to understand that? Well, with my colleagues in England, they did textual analysis of 36 descriptions of Vanitas paintings and did text analysis, computer AI text analysis to to get the relationship between objects in these paintings and meanings. So smoke 
means life's brevity, or a crown means power, or bread symbolizes Christianity and so forth. So now we can click on the painting. We actually haven't done this, but you could click on the painting and the AI would say, ah, that's a skull. And in this painting, it means mortality. Um, and let me end with this work actually came from Google, um, Arts and Culture for uh, rejuvenating or uh, bringing back to life lost artworks. Here's a, a painting done by Gustav Klimt and there's a black and white photograph of it taken in 1945 before, uh, during World War II in Vienna before the British and American army arrived and the Nazis burned this painting and all we have it survived is the uh, black and white photo. Well, using surviving um, paintings by Klimt, textual descriptions and a lot of uh, information, you can now colorize this painting. So all these colors are computed by um, uh, a deep neural network and art scholars, uh, Klimt scholars find this very, very convincing and so forth. So this is the start of a project that we're working on here at Stanford and elsewhere, which is to recover lost artworks. Many of the most important paintings are lost, but we have surviving sketches, we have textual descriptions and so forth. So this is one kind of component technology, the color, coloration, uh, but others are important in putting together and recovering lost artwork. Well, that's all I have time to talk about today. I wanna to thank you for your attention and I'm very eager to hear any questions. Hey, David, thank you so much. I mean, the art history has evolved so much. Your contributions um, are really astounding. Um, a couple of quick questions. Uh, sure. We we talked about the the overarching theme is that some of these works are iconic. They're meaningful in our history as humans. Um, do you think, though, that with these new AI tools, that will perhaps change which works are considered important over time? Um, perhaps. I think this is showing us uh, new ways to look at art. So, for instance, what are the most influential artworks? <laughs> what, um, doing massive data analyses, uh, Ahmed El Gamal um, has, has worked on this problem, sort of which were the key artworks that changed the course of art history? And it's only when you do analysis of tens even hundreds of thousands of artworks that you can see trends and so forth. Um, and so I think it will highlight new works or uh, certain works. Also, my work on recovering lost artworks, I think some of the most important artworks are lost. And if we could see them well, um, art scholarship would indeed change and that we would now start admiring works that Many people don't have never even heard of, like Expulsion of the Moriscos, which I think might be the most important painting ever created, but it's it's lost because it was of fire. That's so interesting. And thank you for bringing that back to us. I think that's really important. <laughs> it's not done yet. <laughs> when it comes, when it comes. So speaking of the future, and you know, you've talked about that there are limitations in, in what AI can achieve right now. How do you hope yes. these tools will evolve? What would you want AI programmers right now to keep in mind? Yes, uh, excellent question. Well, we're at a fortunate time where more and more data is coming online. And I can easily imagine in five, certainly 10 years, basically all art, at least of the Western canon, is online and searchable and um, uh, you know available for uh, training deep neural networks and things like this. I think what's most important is getting the art scholars to understand these techniques and work alongside, hand in hand with uh, computer scientists to find questions and tools that would serve their interests. My, having worked with art scholars for many years, the the wrong way to approach them is say, look at this interesting tool. Isn't this cool? You should be interested in what I'm doing. No. And the thing to do is for the computer scientist to go 95% of the way towards what the art scholars are interested in and say, how can I help you? So getting the art scholars, I mean, my real hope is through my book and the courses I'm teaching at the Courtauld Institute and here at Stanford, of course, um, that these kinds of techniques will be 
just part and parcel of art scholarship going forward, the way a microscope is a tool for a biologist and a telescope for an, art, uh, an astronomer, these computer tools will be tools for um, art scholars. That's great. And, and uh, to that end, are there problems that we haven't solved as art historians <laughs> that you think are really significant? You, you listed a ton of problems we have been able to, to sort of solve yeah. in terms of perspective and um, yeah. but there are some limitations. And and so yeah. are there any problems um, that you've tried to solve and it's been inconclusive, things where, you know, you do hope we, we get more insight? Well, I think the recovering art is an immense problem and we're re really just getting started. And so this is a multi-year project and it will take a lot of work. But the ones that interest me most are the ones that are not being addressed by traditional AI and it, that it's based on semantics, the deeper meanings that two paintings can look very, very different on their surface structure and just um, uh, really convey the same meaning. Rather than give an art example, imagine you have several uh, advertising images about the warnings of global warming, uh, you know, warnings about global warming. Uh, it might be a polar bear on a small piece of ice, or it might be uh, uh, a forest in flames or something like this. Nevertheless, we recognize those have the same import, the same meaning. How do we do that amidst all the variations in the surface structure? That's a deep, deep problem that I'm working on and I hope more uh, scholars uh, work on, but it's going to take a long time to really address that problem. Thank you. That's super interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this question. There are a lot of new tools being used even to create art and your specialty yeah. is still painting and drawing very traditional modalities. Yeah. Do you think that yeah. these modalities are in jeopardy of going away or do you think that they will always be important forms of human creation? I personally am not particularly interested in, you know, um, Dali as a creative tool. I do think art will change in the next 10 to 15 years more than it has changed in the last 500, perhaps. Who can do it, how easy it is, what kinds of things can be done and so forth. Um, I'm still interested in the great masterpieces, the you know works on canvas with oil and so forth that we know and love because there's so much to be understood there. Um, but um, yes, I think there's gonna be sort of a closer relationship between uh, art creation, computer art creation and computer art analysis, but they're really different fields. By analogy, we have computer graphics, make a computer graphic image and computer vision, try to analyze. Likewise, we have art, uh, studio art, make a painting and um, art history, which is analyze a painting. They overlap, they're interested in similar things, but they're fundamentally different um, endeavors and with different notions of success. So I follow the AI art generation a little bit, but I'm much more interested in the computer vision than AI for analysis and understanding. So the human touch is still important. I Well, uh, for now, <laughs> well, certainly for the past ones and uh, uh -huh. understanding how Leonardo and Cezanne and Monet, how they worked <laughs> and understanding our cultural patrimony, there's still lots of problems uh, with the, I'll call it traditional art that we have to address um, before we, before I'm going to be drawn to looking at uh, purely digitally made art. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, David. It was a fascinating presentation. We appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you so much.